in the letter to the Church of Colossae, so Colossians chapter number 2. Again, I am very thankful that you guys are here tonight. I'm always thankful when you're here. And uh, we trust that the preaching service will be a help to you as well. Be in prayer for Pastor and Mrs. Price. Um, anytime, just, just be in prayer for them in general. But anytime that they are away, I always specifically pray for them even more. Uh, so that way they can come back to us and continue to minister to us the wonderful way that they typically do. Hey, tonight I just really want to help encourage you in a way. I want to be able to provide uh, biblical truth that you and I can apply in our lives. I want us to be able to see how we can learn from God's Word, use it in our life, and be blessed by it. Um, when we study Scripture... Oftentimes, if not every time, it's for our particular benefit. And you guys came here tonight on purpose. You guys came here to be ministered to. You guys came here to be taught and uh, for the purpose of growth. And it's not necessarily to hear a particular speaker, but rather to hear from God's Word. And that's what I want to do tonight. I want to be able to teach from God's Word. And we'll go to Colossians 2. I trust that what we'll study tonight will actually be a real help to you as it was a help to me. Colossians 2, we'll begin reading at verse number 6, we'll read a few verses, we'll pray, and we'll jump right into the message. Colossians chapter 2, beginning at verse number 6, the Bible says, As ye have therefore received Christ, Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with, uh, therein with thanksgiving. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the teaching or the tradition of men and the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And ye are complete in him. Complete means mature. You are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. Let's pray. So Lord, thank you for the opportunity, Lord, that we have to look from your word and see what it says and apply it in our lives. And I just pray that first off, you will just cleanse me of sin and to me and myself and fill me with the spirit that I might be able to preach what thus saith the Lord. And Lord, I pray that this particular passage would be applicable in our lives. Uh, put me aside, the Lord. Help me not to say anything I'm not supposed to. And may you get all the honor and glory we pray in your name. Amen. So we know what an epistle is. This particular letter that we're reading is an epistle, or what an epistle is, is a letter that an apostle writes, specifically usually to a church, or even to a particular individual. Now, when you study the New Testament, the person who does much of the writing of the New Testament, and even a lot of the epistles, is the apostle Paul, and God uses Paul in a great deal, and Paul is the one that's writing this particular epistle to the church of Colossians, or excuse me, the church of Colossae. Now, usually when Paul writes an epistle, if you study how he writes the epistle, he always writes with the purpose to instruct, or writes with the purpose to help correct what may be going wrong in particular churches, or even so much what's going on in someone's particular life. And when you're reading a lot of Paul's writings, it's very, he's very blunt, very direct, very to the point, not really messing around. He really is, in essence, if you will, kind of reprimanding for the purpose to help that particular church be corrected. If you read 1 Corinthians, uh, that's one of the uh, uh, main epistles that I think of. Paul writes to the Corinthians, and essentially right off the bat in chapter 3, he calls them carnal, saying, for you, you're yet carnal. I mean, wherein, there, wherein therefore you guys have strife and envy and divisions, are you not carnal that you walk as men? And Paul is calling this particular church carnal, which is that they are Christians, but they're living as in the world. In the rest of chapter 3, we talk about the division that's in the church. You guys say that I'm of Paul. You guys are saying that I'm of someone else. And you have this division here. Uh, in chapter 5, Paul is talking to the Corinthians about their immorality and some of the things that's going on in the church. Chapter 7, uh, Paul is talking about the relationship or, or marriage, if you will. Uh, the next chapter, we're talking about food offered to idols. And Paul just really hits home particular topics to help other people grow. That type of tone isn't necessarily found here to the letter to the church of Colossae. In fact, 
he's actually really praising Colossae for what they're doing. He's actually really impressed. If you read chapter 1, and even if you looked at verse 4, you would say that since we've heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, or faith in Jesus, or Christ Jesus and your love which ye have to all saints. If you read the next few verses, Paul's saying, hey, we even heard from Epaphras, and you guys are doing a great job, and I'm really appreciative. And even in that letter, we see Paul giving instruction or giving doctrine throughout the rest of the letter of Colossae. And I think the thing that he's really going for, you can find in chapter 1, verse 10. You don't have to go there. I'll read it for you. But he says that ye may walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. The purpose that uh, Paul is writing for Colossae is so that way they can walk worthy of the Lord unto all things pleasing. Wouldn't you want that said of you? I know I would definitely want that said of me. That my walk, the walk that I have, the life that I have would be pleasing to the Lord. That everything that I do and everything that I say would help me bring honor and glory to God. And everything that I do would please God himself. And the rest of the letter of Colossae, we really see uh, Paul take some steps. And in Col uh, Colossi, uh, Colossians 2... Paul is given instruction on how the church of Colossae can even go further, or if you will, increase. Now, I know tonight is Wednesday night, but I think if we just take a couple minutes, I, I don't anticipate on being long tonight, but then again, every time I say that, it's almost 9.30 when I'm done. Uh, I'm just kidding. It won't be that long. Um, I don't anticipate on being long, but I just want to give us what Paul says are just a few steps on how we can continue to work, to walk worthily, unto the Lord, unto all things pleasing. Now, in verse number 6, the Bible says, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. This verse is essentially a, a, a comprehension and then a do kind of a verse. So there's two parts of this verse. This first part is something that I really want you guys to comprehend. Hey, you guys need to make sure you get this. Then once you get this, you will be able to do the other part of the verse. Uh, let's imagine for a second that I'm playing basketball, I'm coaching a basketball game, and my team is down by six points, and Charlie's on my team, and I tell Charlie to shoot a three, and just like the all-star athlete that Charlie is, he jacks up a three with his amazing form, and it goes swoosh, swish, straight in there. And I congratulate him, hey, good job, Charlie, I really appreciate it. Hey, just like you did right there, I need you to shoot another one and make it. Okay, so now Charlie understands, just as he hit that first three-pointer, I need him to do it again, make another three-pointer. And that's what we see here in verse number six. The Bible says, as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. That word as, uh, it, it gives the idea of in the same manner, or in the same likeness. So in the same likeness, that you receive Christ Jesus, that same likeness, so walk ye in him. Which leads to ask the question, well, what manner was that? How is it that you and I accept Christ Jesus? You can really just narrow it down in, in one word. You guys tell me the word. What manner is it that we accept Christ Jesus the Lord? Faith. 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 Through faith, we accept Jesus Christ, okay? That is the complete trust in God's word that he is able to do what he says he's going to do. The Bible tells us that uh, except a man be born again, he cannot enter the, the kingdom of heaven. So unless I'm born again, I won't see the kingdom of heaven. So I must be born again. The Bible teaches that the Son of God, who is Jesus, died for our sins, died in our place on the cross, and then when he died, he took on the sins of the whole world, and he uh, allowed that to be the payment or the substitution for me, so that way if I accept that through faith, I now accept Jesus Christ or received Christ the Lord, and I have an eternity with him in heaven. Okay, let's, let's think this through. We can't really take a strand of Jesus' hair, if you will, and do a DNA test, like, okay, let's see, uh, let's take this back to the lab, and we'll take a look, and we'll see, um, <clears throat> excuse me, 
We'll see if it matches up to the DNA of God. Oh, yeah. Oh, great. Green light. All right. That's the Son of God. I don't mean to be silly, but we, we really can't do that. If I think that Jesus Christ is God, which he says in his word, which is true, then I choose to believe that by faith. I have to accept that by faith. Okay, the Bible tells me that Jesus' blood can cleanse me of all my sins. So if I took a pool of Jesus' blood, maybe a small little sample of Jesus' blood, and put it under a microscope, I'm not going to look and say, ah, that's the detergent type molecule that actually cleanses other people's blood. We're not going to find that. But I have to take that by faith that his blood is enough to allow me to enter heaven if I accept that by faith and I receive Christ by faith. But not only is it the idea of trusting God of his word, but it's depending on God to do for you that in which you cannot do for yourself. I think of... Uh, Timothy McVeigh, he is the, um, for those of you who are probably younger don't really know, Timothy McVeigh is the person who bombed the Oklahoma City building, the, um, the law building up there in Oklahoma City. FBI. Hmm? It was the FBI. I'm sorry? It was the FBI building. The FBI building, yes, thank you. Okay, so, government building, same thing. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thanks, Charlie. Um, he's the one that blew that building up. Um, Right in his last interview, before he was put to death, um, the reporter asked him, do you believe in an afterlife? Do you believe that there is going to be another life right after this? And he says, no, not really. I don't, I don't believe in heaven. I don't really believe in hell. And I don't believe in God. Um, I don't think any of that really just exists. I just, I feel like I'm my own kind of renegade. And, you know, that's, that's what I believe. But if there is a God, um, I will bargain with him. Because that's all I've done all my life. I'm a bargainer. I, I make deals. So if I see God, I'll try to make a deal. Okay. There is not an iota of a bargaining chip that I can present to God in which you'll even entertain the thought that I am worthy enough to enter into heaven. There is not a thing that I can do or a dollar amount that I can come up with that I can present to God and say, God, this is why you should allow me into heaven. Not even close. In fact, in my best life, in all the great things that I could do, the Bible describes my great works as filthy rags. And it's good for nothing. Absolutely nothing. So it's not anything that I can do. So if I can't get myself into heaven, I can't talk myself into heaven, then I have to depend on somebody who can do it for me. And that's where faith lies in. That exact same faith, which saves us from eternity in hell, is the faith that we are referred to here in verse number six. Listen, friend, there is absolutely, again, nothing that you can do. There's no amount of right that you can do. There's no amount of good that you can accomplish. But it's everything that Christ died. If you believe that Jesus died according to the scriptures, was buried and then resurrected according to the scriptures, if you believe that his sacrifice was enough for you, and you accept that through faith, then the first half of verse 6 comes into play. You have received Christ as your Savior. And your eternity is set in him. Now, in that exact same faith, we look back at verse number six. Okay, so the Bible says, As ye have therefore received Christ the Lord. And again, how do we receive Christ? By? Amen. By faith. Okay, so as we have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. When the Bible refers to walk, or to your life, he, it often correlates it to a walk. Now I'm a millennial. A lot of you know that. And I'm kind of somewhat proud of it. Not really. Uh, but growing up my entire life, uh, you get the idea of just really wish it. You know, just just have a huge wish. And, and, and when you wish big and you dream big, man, you're going to accomplish big. You think of the, the Disney... Um, theme song, if you will, when you wish upon a star, makes no difference who you are, anything your heart desires shall come to you. And that's part of what 
I learned and part of what I was taught and part of what I was fed, okay, wishing is dandy and, and I'm not against having goals and setting goals and trying to accomplish goals, but wishing gets you absolutely nowhere. If wishing got me somewhere, I wouldn't be here. I would actually be on the campus of ESPN being a sports host. For much of my life, that's exactly what I wanted to do. I thought that was my dream job. That's what I wanted to accomplish. By the way, I'm glad I'm not doing that. But that's really what I wanted to do. I was really excited about that. And I even went to school for broadcasting. Um, but again, wishing has nothing to do it. Life is not made up of wishes. Life is not made up of these dreams and these ideas that we can just have. And the next thing you know, we dream big enough and then poof. We are what we dreamed of. That's not the case. Life is full of choices and full of decisions. I, I've heard a preacher um, uh, illustrate it this way. Uh, by a show of hands, how many of you, let's, let's go back to when we were 16. How many of you were asked the question, what do you want to be when you, were gr when you would grow up? Okay, a lot of us. A lot of us were asked that particular question. Okay, what do you want to be when you grow up? Um, I was asked that at 16, and uh, how many of you guys had an answer for it? Okay, a lot of you had an answer for it. How many of you now are doing something different than what your answer would have been when you were 16? Yeah, my hand would also be up as well. Great. So we all failed at life, okay, according to the wishers and the dreamers and, and just, you know, you got to think big and all of those things, okay. No, we do not fail at life. The, the idea of that is we have steps and things come up out of our lives and the decisions that we make put us into this particular position that we're in now. You guys are here in church tonight, July 25th, 2018, on a Wednesday night because you decided to be here. You didn't accidentally come. You didn't plug it in your Google Maps and bought the self-driving car and accidentally came about this way. Okay, you made the decision, just like the, you would make a decision if you were not to be here. Now, I understand things come up, sometimes we get sick or we're out of town, but when we're out of town, we're deciding not to be here because it's, you know, we're away. And those decisions make up what we would call life. And when the Bible refers to life as a walk, those steps that we take or the decisions help us get to the position that we are or where we would be when we take those steps. Now the Bible says, in that same manner that you receive Jesus Christ, which is by faith, walk in him in that same manner, which is, I will take those steps and I will walk in faith. That is trusting God with what he says and what he would have for your life. Whatever God says is good for your particular life and how you should live it is exactly how we would walk in faith. If God says that I need to walk a particular way, then I need to have the faith in God to take each step and make sure that I do that and trust the fact that it is best for my life. That God has his best for me and then when I take that walk or take those steps, I trust in the fact that God has everything else under control and that my life is exactly what he wants it to be. Now, not only do we trust in the Lord in that particular manner, but again, faith also connotates the idea of depending on God to provide in a way that you cannot provide for yourself. You will not find a command in scripture that was given by God that God did not give at least the strength for or the ability for someone to do. And God's not going to tell you, hey, I want you to live this way and then completely abandon you and say, good luck, you're on your own. Hope you figure it out. No, it's not the God that we serve. It's not the God that we have. Walking in faith is believing what God says and living the way that he says and then also trusting that he has the ability to allow you to, to, garner, to garner the strength to do and accomplish that particular purpose. Now, 
I am not a father. I am not married. So I cannot use this illustration and say I understand in the essence of, oh yeah, I can correlate it with my son or my daughter. But uh, I think of someone who's very important to me. A lot of you know that my dad is one of the most important people in my life. He's one of the most um, godly people in my particular life. And in growing up and watching my dad, you can definitely tell that God had completely control in my father's life. Complete control in his life. It's not because my dad's perfect. It's not because he's a he's a the best Christian that's ever existed. And you know, God just loves my dad so much more than he loves any of us. It, it's not any of that. My dad oftentimes told me that it's important that we learn to walk in that faith that's being taught about in Colossians 2, verse 6. Walking in that faith, trusting God with particular things in the good and in the bad, you will trust God that the steps that you are taking is exactly according to His will, and then when you take those steps, God has everything else under control, and by the way, He gives you the strength to do it. And by the way, you get the courage to do it as well. And that's the faith that you and I live by. So by that faith that we've received Christ, we also walk in that exact same manner, walking in faith, trusting God in faith, and doing what we're supposed to do, taking the steps in faith. When you do that, God gives you the strength to do what he wants you to do. Now I understand, Christian, that life does get difficult. There are difficult points in life. There are tough times in life, and there are issues in life that come up that you're just like, man, God, I, I have no idea what to do. You, you're meaning to tell me, Taj, that God has an opinion on everything and anything that I go through? And my answer to that would be yes. God does have an opinion on how you live your life and each and every decision that you make. Now, I wouldn't go really crazy and be like, hmm, I prayed for 30 minutes and now I know this is the tie that God wanted me to wear today. Yeah, I'm, I'm completely in the center of God's will. I wore two socks today instead of one. And um, I believe it's God's will that tonight for dinner I'm going to have a 16-ounce steak. So I'm going to make Charlie pay for it and I'll be in God's will. Okay, it's not necessarily that particular, I was halfway kidding about that, Charlie. Um, it's, uh, it, it's not necessarily in that way. But man, struggling with family, God has an opinion about that. Struggling with finances, God has an opinion on how you should handle that. Struggling with relationships, whether it be intimate or, or work-related or just friendships, God has the exact same opinion about that. And he wants you to rely on him and walk in faith that whatever God says, you'll be able to do, and he'll give you the strength to do it as well. Now, how do we do that? How do we walk in faith? And I think we can see that in verse number 7. The Bible says, rooted and built up. Okay, so the idea of rooted, uh, a lot of people think of plants, we think of a tree. I have a lot of respect for the teenager in the back, Anthony, uh, who worked really hard to get this stump out here in the front a couple weeks ago. Uh, that root system was really crazy, wasn't it, buddy? Yeah. It was intense. And it was the craziest root system I personally have ever seen. Um, Devin can back me up on this. We, we've taken out trees before in college, and it's a lot of times they're palm trees that we take out. So the root system for them is not too crazy. And plus, we have 15 guys that take out one tree anyway, and one of them is running a tractor, and typically I was the one that was running the tractor, because um, I was the laziest. And they would hook the tractor up to the tree and just kind of yank it out, and any tough root that would come, you would take an axe or you would take a machete and you would just chop off at that root. But I've never seen an in intense root system as the stump that Anthony had took out. That, that thing, that tree was not going to move in any realm. Think about it. We had a couple hurricanes here uh, in the past few years, and that tree didn't budge. But on the way driving down back from when I evacuated, I saw palm trees all over the place in central Florida. Uh, they, they were all over the place, limbs on the floor, the trees actually in the road. It was, it was just ridiculous. It was absolutely crazy. But that tree didn't budge. 
Okay, the idea of being rooted up is that same type of idea. I being rooted or planted or solidly founded on the foundation, which is Christ, that I do that by faith, I'm rooted, then I'm built up in that particular manner. The more rooted that I am, the more the next phrase applies is the fact that I will be established or established. Rooted, built up in him, and established. By the way, in what? You said it earlier. Thank you. All right, it's right there in the verse. Established in faith. All right, um, that's that's what happens. The more that I establish, friend, the less chance I'll have at being moved. That tree wasn't going anywhere unless we completely destroyed the roots. Now think about your walk. How many times do you get tempted? just on a daily basis to do what you know is not right. <laughs> Probably more than you can count. At least a couple times, maybe a few, each day, you and I get tossed with temptation. And the more that you and I are rooted, that is rooted in Christ, we'll be able to be established and stand firm. How do you get rooted in Christ? I think of John chapter 1, Verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Okay? So, in the beginning was the Word, in the beginning was the Word, and then the Bible also says that the Word was God. So, Jesus is the body form of the Word. Okay? This is eternal. Jesus is eternal. This is perfect. Jesus is perfect. This is an errant. Jesus is an errant. So, as I read what is perfect and eternal and inerrant, I will begin to learn what Jesus is and how Jesus wants me to, be live, or to live my life. And when I'm persuaded in that, I then become rooted and built up and established. The more that I understand how God wants me to live, the more that I understand who God is, the more that I understand what God wants me to know, I become more and more rooted. And when you do that, walking in faith, taking those steps in faith, making decisions in faith, becomes a lot more easier. A lot easier. But beware. See, we're hit with a warning right now. Beware. Look out. Keep attention. All right? Verse number eight. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy, vain deceit, Traditions of men, the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. <clears throat> that idea of spoiled. Um, a lot of times when you and I think of spoiled, we think of just constantly being given. Give, 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 give. Oh, that person has so much, they are spoiled. But really the idea of spoiling is, is, is taking away, to, to, to take. Um, we're familiar with the phrase, you don't want to eat that right now, it will spoil your appetite. Uh, in college, uh, we had six guys and, and myself, and we all did something called No Sugar September. Now, it wasn't natural sugars like what you would find in bread or even certain vegetables, but more so processed sugars, so sweets, cakes, um, sodas, candy, that kind of thing. Uh, we cut that all out, so we couldn't nibble on a Debbie cake or snack on a donut or anything like that. So we did that for an entire month um, of September, No Sugar September. And then October 1st, when October 1st came, we, <laughs> yes, Shamir, we celebrated, okay? Uh, sometimes aggressively, but we, we did celebrate, um, oftentimes with like an ice cream or, or a donut from Krispy Kreme or something like that. Um, I remember our final year in seminary. So this is year number six of my Pensacola experience. Final year in seminary, the final September. And we did it. And it was like, we're millennials, so it's emotional. So it was like an emotional moment for us. We're like, oh, guys, this is it. Oh, man. Okay, so let's, let's, let's bump it up. Let's go to Cinnabon. Okay, let's get a cinnamon roll from Cin Cinnabon. is the greatest thing ever made. And that's for free. That's not doctrine. That's just my correct opinion. Um, Cinnabon is, is absolutely amazing. So we went to Cinnabon. Now my girlfriend at the time, uh, we were supposed to have dinner that night, and she told me, listen, if you're going to go to Cinnabon, those things are big. Have a piece of it, but, but don't eat the whole thing because it will spoil your appetite. And I'm like, yeah, babe, okay, I got you. Okay, I'll only have a little bit of it. And I, 
I wasn't thinking. I didn't have a little bit of it. I didn't have a half of it. I ate the whole Cinnabon. Then I bought another one and <laughs> ate that as well. Um, it was so. It was so good. So. On average, uh, a Cinnabon is about like 900 calories, right? And uh, the average person consumes about 2,000 calories. And so I had 1,800 calories in 15 minutes with only 200 to spare. And uh, it was just absolute, needless to say, I number one, I got sick. That just was so much sugar and it did not sit well with me at all. And I... I went to dinner and I got a plate and I sat down with my lady and she's one of those people that's like it's awkward for her like if two people are sitting down but only one of them is eating um that's weird I can eat in front of you and I don't care if you eat with me or not uh, but she she did she that was awkward to her and she was like you're not eating anything and I'm like yes I am and I would get like a grain of rice and try to eat that uh it was just such a difficult moment for me okay I was a little gluttonous at that point but I spoiled <laughs> my appetite I took away my appetite I took away what actually probably would have been more nourishing for me and instead succumbed to sin and delicious cinnamon godly manna um, and that's in very essence in a little more of a serious tone exactly what Paul is telling us here in verse 8 beware lest any man spoil you okay so you have the idea that you have accepted or you receive Christ through faith now you know to walk in faith to be rooted and built up and then with that you'll be established wherein you will be in Thanksgiving as well and the fact of the matter is the Bible is telling us beware lest any man take that away from you and when they take it away from you they will replace it with the first thing the Bible says is philosophy there's a lot of intelligent people out there, but there are a lot of intelligent people out there that don't know the truth at all. Uh, I think uh, the recent, the late Stephen Hawking, um, arguably the smartest scientist of my lifetime in, in our current era right now. And he was filled with a lot of knowledge. And right before he died, probably about a few months, maybe a year before he died, he came to a conclusion that there's just no such thing as God. And God didn't exist. After all these years of study, he said, um, he knew that God just wasn't real and didn't exist. Okay, that is a person that I would consider probably really, really smart, very intelligent, full of knowledge, at, at least we can agree on that, but he didn't know the truth. And by the way, there's a lot of people like that. There's a lot of people that follow others and they take their philosophies or their word world views and they co-exist them if you will into their particular life and try to just live on what Buddha teaches and what Muhammad teaches and what Oslo teaches and what all these different philosophers of these times teach and just try to live that perfect in-between life and the fact of the matter is there may be some moral truth to some of those things but they're not the truth and we cannot allow that to replace what we know by faith. Um, the next thing is vain deceit. So vain, the idea of empty. Deceit, the idea of a lie. I, I think of cotton candy. I love cotton candy. You eat it, it's so good. It's puffy when you put it in your mouth and then it just dissipates or disintegrates once you salivate and once it gets wet. Okay, It's, it's that empty goodness that that thing that seems so right but it's a lie and it's empty I think a lot of Christians really do struggle with vain deceit as well uh, I think of the Christians that are struggling with depression they're basing their depression off of two particular lies nobody cares about me and I'm all alone those are the two main lies of depression and we know the answer to both of those and that's Jesus Jesus does care Jesus loves, and you're not alone, you have Christ, you have the Holy Spirit living in you. I'm not trying to undermine the reality of depression, it's, it's very serious, but at the same token, it comes about because you have chosen to believe the lies of depression. I can't tell you 
uh, how many Christians that I personally know that are even struggling with drugs, thinking that, man, this is going to provide some sort of peace or calm or comfort. And really, it can't. It really just hurts. Uh, here's a very serious one. Pornography. That it will provide some sort of pleasure, but it, it never does. And that's the idea of feign to see. Don't let that replace what you know is truth by faith. Traditions of men. That's, that's the next one. Literally the idea of, well, it's always been done. My daddy did it. My granddaddy did it. My great-granddaddy did it. So I do it because I think since they did it, they're good men. It's probably right. Or the world has always done this. It's always been this way. I'm just going to continue to do it. That's not the idea that you and I to, need to live by. We don't need to live by word of mouth and the traditions of men. Do not let that replace. Do not let that take away or spoil what you know to be true by faith. And then the rudiments of the world. All of those things, by the way, are not after Christ. Just like the end of verse 8 says, it's not after Christ rudiments, the idea of building blocks or thinking blocks of the world, whatever the world thinks and what they establish in their thinking. Don't let that replace or spoil what you may know by true, that is true by faith, okay? So, to wrap it up, to finish up, verse 9 and 10 are a good way to help you understand who you are and what you have in Christ. Again, in verse 6, okay, we accept Christ through faith. We understand who Christ is through faith, okay? And, and we understand how we received him through faith, and so because of that, we will now walk with him in faith. And when we do that, how do we do that? Well, we get rooted, that's in Christ, have the root system in Christ, founded in Christ, built up, and then we will be established and established in that same faith. Uh, but beware that any man spoil you with philosophy, vain deceit, traditions of men, rudiments of the world. The Bible says in verse 9, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Everything that you need is in Christ. Everything that you'll need is there in Christ. And then verse number 10. The Bible says, and ye are complete. That idea of complete is, is true. That idea is mature. You are made uh, uh, perfect, made complete in him. And who's him? Christ. Jesus Christ. Everything that you need, you now can walk and live mature because you understand that everything that you need is in him. And you are complete in Him. Your completion, your totality is in Christ. There's nothing that this world can offer you, friend, that is going to supplant anything that Christ has for you. There's nothing that this world can give you that is better than what Christ has for you. There's nothing that you have on this earth that's more than what you have in Christ. And so with that, learn to walk holy unto all things pleasing knowing what you know by faith walking in that faith being established in that faith unmovable and beware beware of those around you if we're supposed to beware we have to recognize that there are avenues that people can reach us friend beware of what you watch on TV Beware of the music that you listen to. Beware of the social media that you take in. Beware of the people around you that you call friends that do not love the Lord. Beware of the place that you would go to that isn't Christ-like. Beware of those things. Be, be circumspect. Walk cautiously. Because everything you have is in Jesus Christ. About a month ago, I... Um, we went to the Bell Rice Ranch in Tennessee and I taught Sunday school for the teenagers and we thought of the verse that ye are now children of light so walk in that light recognize who you are in Christ and walk in faith 
and you'll see God will bless you for it. Father, thank you so much for what you've taught us and what we've learned. And I pray that we'll be able to walk in faith so that way we can walk holy of the Lord unto all things pleasing. We ask this in your name. Amen. Okay. Um, as typical, we will take time to go over prayer requests.